Yeah, make some noise. Give it up for the Lord. Yeah, man. Yeah, praise Him. Well, thank you all for being with us this morning. Uh, it means a lot. Every time I uh, stand up here and I look onto the crowd and I see new faces and I see familiar faces, and so I want to say uh, welcome if you're new, um, for those of you that are here for the first time, and welcome for those that are joining us for the first time in a long time. Either way, we're, we're excited that you guys are with us today. Um, and our heart's desire is that you encounter Jesus, uh, not religion, not church, but the one who loves you, the one who gave his life for you, the one that has an amazing plan for your life, that you encounter him. Uh, the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I know I use that scripture a lot because I love it. Taste and see. Uh, he didn't say, listen and be persuaded. Um, he didn't say, understand and be convinced. He said, taste and see. In other words, we can experience Jesus. We can encounter him in this way. Um, and, and we do that every time we come together as a body. Yes, you can do this individually, uh, but we can do it corporately as a church body. Um, we're designed that way. And so uh, I'm excited. I'm stirred that even as we get into this word, um, that this word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, that it pierces, that it penetrates, that it does a deep work in your heart, that the Lord begins to uh, bring comfort to the afflicted, and I pray that he afflict the comfortable in this place, that he just disrupt you out of your seat and out of your normal and out of your comfortable. This is what Christianity should look like, right? The Bible calls us a peculiar people. We shouldn't look like the world, right? We shouldn't look like the rest of it. The way it looks out there. When we belong to him and we're joined to him, there's a fruit that is produced of our union together. And it should draw people to us in, in the same way that a fruit tree draws people. And people go and they, they get fruit. There should be a fruit on our life that people see that they desire. And the Lord wants to do that in them. And so, uh, you know, it reminds me of... Just the other day, I know this weather is so strange, but how many of you love it? It's awesome, right? You don't know if it's going to be warm, if it's going to be rainy, if it's going to be cold. And, and just the other day, we had this unexpected rain, right? I don't even think it was on the forecast. And uh, I was in a store, and uh, I was deep inside of the store where I couldn't see the, the doors or the windows. And a person next to me got a phone call. And I could hear them on the, you know, they're loud. And so, you know, people now, they just put their phone on speaker and they just talk for the world to hear them. And so uh, the person on the other end of the phone is telling them, hey, it's raining outside. And so it's raining, you know. So now, now the store knows it's raining outside. Okay. And so as I get closer to the door, I see a person walk in out of the rain and they're drenched, completely dripping. Now, he didn't say a word. One person is saying it's raining with his words. The other person walks in and is dripping with the substance of his testimony. In the same way it needs to look like this for us, when there's fruit on our life, we can use words, but you don't have to use words. You, you'll be dripping. You'll be saturated with the substance of the one that you carry and the message that you send. Jesus, you'll be dripping with this man, Jesus. There'll, there'll be an aroma, a fragrance on you that smells just like him. The, the Bible talks about this. This is fruit. Everyone say fruit. And it's God's desire that we have this kind of fruit. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, we started a new series last week called Risen. And, you know, I, I was telling you last week, I don't want to wait until Easter Sunday, which is the last Sunday of this month. I don't want to wait to get there to herald the message that he is risen. I want to start as early as I can. In fact, I, I don't even want to stop this message. Without this message that he's risen, church, we can't even be called Christians. We can't even be called believers. Because if Jesus didn't rise, then, then we didn't rise either. And, and Paul says, and, and your religion is a farce. If he didn't get up, but he did rise on that third day. But here's the thing. Most people don't understand, and come Easter Sunday, as I told you last week, every church in America and probably around the world is going to bring their service to a crescendo as they herald the message that he is risen, and rightly so, and they should. But the crime is that most people don't understand what it means that Jesus is risen. 
And so last week we, we started and we, we began to share about your identity in Christ. Because your identity is found in the significance of the finished work of the cross. And this was last week. Don't have time to, to get into that. It's, it's on YouTube today. You can go back if you missed it. Listen to that free of charge. And because it's free and no charge, it means that there's no excuse. So get caught up and start listening. But today I want to talk to you about another significant aspect of the finished work of the cross. And that's you producing fruit. Everyone say fruit. This is important. Quick commercial. Uh, because Easter is rapidly approaching, we had these cool little signs made. So this is just a, a yard sign that goes in your grass, if you so choose. And it's just an invite to join us at Rivergate on Easter, and it gives all the information. And then when Easter is over, you can just pull this out and flip it around, <laughs> put it back in the ground, and it'll just invite them to church on Sunday. So we have a hundred of these, um, and there's no pressure at all to take one. But if you would like to do so, you can grab one on the way out. They're all lined up on the door. Uh, take one. And so I, I think I was the first one. Mine's been up all week because I got these on Tuesday. I, I tried to have them last Sunday. but So mine is all the way forward by the street because we have a lot of people that walk in our neighborhood. And so I just want to make sure that, uh, that you guys get one of these. Uh, now, I will tell you, there's a little bit of accountability with these signs in the same way that if you put a Jesus loves you bumper sticker on your car, uh, what are some things you cannot do anymore if you have a Jesus loves you bumper sticker on your car? What are some things you can't do? Just help me out. Class participation. You can't cut people off. You can't flip people off. Very good. You can't tell them they're number one anymore. You can't do that. You get it. You got to be nice to some people, right? You got to be courteous. You can't run red lights anymore. Can't go blow through the intersection with Jesus loves you. Same. I'm having fun, but you do understand. Um, if you want one, you can grab one. Make sure you put that out. Uh, it's, I'm kind of asking for a commitment because uh, I'm asking you to keep this in for Easter. And then if you can, just flip it around and uh, invite people to the Lord. So anyway, how many of you would like a sign? Let me just see. Just show of hands. Okay, nice. Okay, so here we go, risen. Let's jump into this. This idea of us being risen with Christ, it's, it's more than an idea, it's actually a reality. And I, I so desire this in my life. I shared with you last week that I'm, I'm not at this place where I feel like I've arrived and I'm a, I'm a you know, an authority in this. Um, there's still air it daily. I feel like daily I'm coming to the Lord um, asking for more of him, which means I have to give him more of myself. And this happens all the time. It's, a, it's like a continual wrestling match with my flesh and with my thoughts. Um, and so it, it does take a daily surrender for this to happen. But I, I do see the transformation happening in my life. I think we all can agree, right? We all look back on our life since we've been following Jesus and we go, okay, I'm, I'm not where I want to be, but, but I'm not where I used to be either, right? Like there is something happening. There's a fruit going on my tree. I'm looking more and more like him. And this is the way it's supposed to be. But let me just give you a few scriptures um, to just kind of stir your faith in, in this new reality. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ. He says, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ. That's a reality. We are raised with him. His death was my death. His resurrection is my resurrection. Jesus died our death so that we can share his life. We've been raised to new life with Christ. Listen to Romans 6, 5. For if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So this isn't just a theory. This is a reality for us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. And having been buried with him in baptism, you were raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. So this being raised with him 
is through our faith, and it's in our faith in the power of God. Uh, And then Galatians 2.20, Paul says it so wonderfully. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what Paul has his faith in and his trust in, the one who loves him and the one who gave his life for him. I share these with you to reinforce this reality that when we celebrate he is risen, his resurrection is our resurrection. Amen? Amen. So, for those who don't know this truth, or maybe those that really struggle with this becoming a reality, there is one obstacle only that will hinder you from experiencing this resurrection life. One thing only, and it's called sin. Everyone say sin. Sin. This is just what it is. So, so let's, let's just for a moment, I want you to suspend your ideas uh, about what sin is. Because for some people, you think sin is smoking. Others think sin is drinking. Others think sin is lying or stealing or cheating or even killing. Now, certainly those are all types of sin. But I would say those are, those are byproducts of sin. Um, that is a fruit that grows on a tree when it's rooted in the wrong soil, is what happens. Um, but let's just look at the origin of sin just for a moment, and then we're going to talk about some of these, these things. I'm going to just uh, extract a few truths, and then we're going to keep moving. So I want to take you to Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. Very familiar. Starting in verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God. They hid among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man, and he asked, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said to him, who told you that you were naked? You have eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from. So a couple of things here that that we see. First of all, um, this word sin in its original language in in the Greek is the word uh, hamartia or or hamartia, hamartia, I believe is is the way you pronounce it. And the word literally means uh, to miss the mark. It's what sin means, to miss the mark. Uh, some people have said that this is a, like an archery term. Um, I don't know that I s- subscribe to that. When I start looking up this word, uh, harmartia, uh, it's actually used as a Greek literary device used in storytelling. Um, and so typically like in a, in a, in a story, in, in a novel, where they're, they're identifying characters, let's just say that there's one particular character who is of noble nature, of good character. He's the hero of the story. And then through a certain chain of events, this hero, this person of noble character, takes a wrong turn, an error. Something begins to happen. A tragedy happens where this person now falls short of his intended purpose in the story. This is, when the Bible describes sin, it's this word uh, in the Greek. This, this literary device of storytelling. So when we talk about missing the mark, it's not that God is keeping score. Um, it's not as if God is examining you like a pass or fail test. 
missing the mark has to do with us becoming who God has called us to be, and sin is what corrupts our identity and causes us to live below God's best. This is what sin does, and this is what happened in the garden. Ever since that, that sin entered humanity, we lost our identity in Christ. We, we began to stray from the Lord. So the first thing I need you to understand is sin is defined as missing the mark. Uh, the second thing I need you to understand that we see in the original sin in the garden is that it separates us from God. Uh, now this is important. Uh, and you've heard me say this before. It, it, it's not that God is hiding from you. It's that we now hide from God. This is what sin does. And we see this happening with, with Adam and the Lord God. Adam realizes he's naked, covers himself with fig leaves, and he hides. But who comes looking for him? God comes looking for him. God's not afraid of sin. I know people say, oh, God can't be in the presence of sin. I can show you so many scriptures where even Satan comes into the presence of the Lord and God doesn't go hiding. It, he's, he's greater than sin. He, he's not intimidated by sin. We're the ones who hide from God. God's the one who comes looking for us. He pursues us. He's chasing us down. This is who he is. And so this is interesting is that they cover themselves up. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And the third thing that we need to understand about sin is that there is a penalty for sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, uh, the scriptures say that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Someone must satisfy the death penalty for sin. Sin is deadly. That's why I don't subscribe to this. Um, it's simply missing the mark, like, like you miss a target. Well, there's no death penalty for missing the target. But when we begin to understand sin in its context and what it does is it pulls you away from the Lord, it causes you to lose your identity, and it begins to slowly corrupt you to a point of death. The penalty for sin is death. It's deadly. And so God has a remedy for the sin crisis. He has an answer, and we even find it in Genesis. Shortly after this instance where Adam and Eve eat the fruit, sin enters humanity. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, the Bible says that God clothes them with the skin of an animal. He removes the fig leaves, and he puts a new garment on them. So even in the very beginning, this suggests a sacrifice. In order for them to wear the skin of an, of, of an animal, it means an animal had to be slain for them to be robed and have a new garment, to have those fig leaves removed. So this is a, a prophetic whisper of what Jesus would do at the cross. This is why it's so important when we talk about he is risen. Church, our identity is completely intertwined in this truth. And the fact that we can bear fruit is completely intertwined in this truth. And apart from this truth, we have no life. And apart from this truth, we have no identity. And, and apart from this truth, we can bear no fruit. So our whole life, the significance of our life is connected in Christ. So this is the answer. And so we're going to talk about this fruit today. Now this is a... The Bible has so many, there's so many themes through Scripture, uh, and trees and fruit are an, another one of the major themes. In fact, there's over 257 passages where trees and fruit are mentioned in Scripture. Old Testament, the majority of them are in the Old Testament. Uh, so trees and fruit are used as metaphors to describe many things in Scripture, uh, one of the main themes that we see, or what they describe, is um, Israel's physical and spiritual well-being. Israel itself, when, when he talks about trees and fruit. Uh, and we're not going to get into this exhaustively today. Um, but just to give you a few, 
in good times, the people, uh, the Bible says that the people are the first fruits of the fig tree in its season. That's found in Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. He, he describes people, his people, Israel, as a fig tree that's bearing fruit. This is in good times, but in times of judgment, um, in times of judgment, it says that the people bear no fruit. We see this in Joel chapter 2, verse 22. Uh, we see it in Habakkuk 3, 17, and in Haggai 2, 19. Uh, in times of judgment, people bear no fruit. In the New Testament, Jesus uses the fig tree uh, to represent Israel's lack of fruit. We see that in Mark 11, 12 through 14. Um, and it's also used as a metaphoric warning system for the time of Jesus' return. Um, and he gives us a parable in Matthew 24, 32, where he says, learn a lesson from the fig tree. You know, when you begin to see it in leaf in full bloom, the, the return of the Son of Man is near. And so there's so many applications of this. So many, many, many uh, metaphors of trees and fruit. And so we, we want to get into some of this today because this is important. Listen, God would not go to great lengths to begin to illustrate to us trees and fruit and how it has to do with his chosen people, but also what it has to do with humanity. Look, I mean, the, the inception of sin and the fall of mankind happened through a tree and fruit. So, th I mean, this theme runs from Genesis to Revelation, so when we read this in Scripture, we don't just throw it away. We don't go, oh, okay, that's kind of weird. No, he, it, it's all part of a, a grand scheme. It, it's all part of our identity and who we are. But listen, church, it all has to do with what he paid for on this cross and he, what he wants you to have through him. So it is clear that fruit is something that God expects from his trees and because we have been engrafted into God through Jesus, uh, Romans 11, 11, we'll talk to you about us being engrafted in, just like a tree, um, that there is a fruit that's produced through our union. However, there is also consequences, everyone say consequences, for not producing fruit. Let me say this in short. God expects fruit on your tree. He's actually looking for it. He, he actually desires it, like he hungers for this fruit. But trees that don't have fruit, there will be a consequence for. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. Uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. It says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized, this is John the Baptist speaking, then he said to them, the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, he calls them brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham out of these very stones." And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which is, does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is John the Baptist preparing the way of Jesus, preparing the way of the Lord. And he sees the Pharisees coming to these baptisms that are happening. And he warns them. He tells them to bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, don't just say you're right with God. There should be a fruit on your tree that demonstrates you're right with God. And then he says this. He says, even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There is a consequence for not bearing fruit. That's just one. Uh, later on in Luke, in Luke 13... Uh, verse 6 through 9, Jesus tells this parable. And he told this parable, and he said, A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Stop right there. Um, I told you that God is looking for fruit. Jesus is looking for fruit. He says this in this parable. He came seeking fruit on it and found none. 
Then he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this tree and I have found none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, leave it alone one more year until I dig around it and fertilize it. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Same thing. Jesus is looking for fruit. This is toward the end of his ministry. He's gone to Jerusalem for three years, for three Passovers. And every time he comes, this is what he's saying, I've come for three years and I don't see fruit yet. There should be a fruit that comes from him, from his word, from believing in him. I find none. I find none. And Jesus is ready to cut this tree down. In other words, there's a judgment coming. It's coming. He's looking for fruit. This is huge. So here's, again, the remedy. Jesus makes a way. Jesus makes a way so that we can bear fruit. But Jesus makes a way so that you, that you are uprooted out of that sinful nature, out of that bad soil. He makes a way. Church, without him, there would be no way. We, we can produce no fruit apart from him. Which brings me to this next parable, which where you know I'm going, this next story. Jesus teaches this to his disciples. It's in John 15. This is significant because this is, this is the night before Jesus is captured in the garden. Uh, this is John 15. The, the entire upper room discourse, the entire upper room discussion happens from John 13 all the way to John 16. John 17 is when Jesus prays his prayer, his last and final prayer. Um, so this, this whole conversation is happening just, just a couple of nights before his crucifixion. John 15, verses 1 through 8. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it will bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. He says, remain in me. That word is to abide in me. And I will also abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Let me say that again. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me, because I am the vine, and you are the branches. And if you remain in me, and I in you, then you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, how much can you do? You can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire to be burned. And if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you would bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So here it is. Jesus is not this unjust, uh, unreasonable God. And to be clear, he is God. He's, he's, he's God that became a man. He's the word that became flesh. And in the same way that sin entered into humanity through tree and fruit, Jesus comes to sever this tree, to uproot this issue, and to plant you into himself to engraft you into his life and nature. The scripture says that we have been called to be partakers of his divine nature. How is that possible? Because you've been engrafted in. And if you abide in him, you'll bear fruit. Apart from him, you can produce no fruit. But this is an ongoing, increasing, perpetual fruit. He says you'll produce fruit. He goes on to say, you'll produce much fruit, and he goes on to say, you'll produce fruit that remains. As long as you abide in him, there will be a continual uh, harvest of fruit on your life, if we abide in him, if we abide in his word, and if we abide in his love. This is all because of Jesus. 
But then he adds this little twist as if that was not enough. He gets pretty definitive about what this fruit looks like. And he says, this fruit looks like answered prayer. That's what he says. He said it. Ask whatever you want. He just finished talking about abiding in him and bearing fruit. And then he clarifies what that fruit looks like. Ask whatever you want according to me, according to my name, or according to my will, and it'll be done for you. And this will be to my Father's glory, and it will show the world that you're my disciples. The, one of the, some of the fruit that he's looking for, now obviously we're talking about fruit of the Spirit. This is fruit of union. But he, he emphasizes this point. That, that your life, church, your life will look like a fruit of answered prayer. This is so powerful. Everyone say answered prayer. Now, he doesn't just say this once. That was John 15. But we see this again in Matthew 21, verse 18. And this is very significant. Uh, now, in Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verse 18. Now, here, here's where this is happening. Uh, I shared with you John 15, which was just the night before he's captured and crucified. Uh, in Matthew 21, this is, this is earlier in the week. Um, this, is, this is what's known as Passion Week or Holy Week. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and there's a series of events that happen every single day, and they're, they're all significant. They all matter, and they all mean something. Uh, it, it would do us well to even do a study of that and just begin to unpack every day. Um, and, and I know I've taught on that before. But in, in, in Matthew 21, uh, let me just read it to you. Here it is. Verse 18 through 21. In the morning as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry. And he noticed a fig tree beside the road. And he went over to see if there were any figs, but there were only leaves. And then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. And the disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? And then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, you can do things just like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into this sea and it will happen. And he says, you can pray for some things. Oh, no, that's not what he says. He says, you can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. Again, Jesus illustrating through a tree that bears no fruit, he curses it, and then he connects it to prayer and having faith in God and having those prayers answered. It, it's, a, it's a type of fruit that grows because Jesus has severed this old tree. Now, again, to keep all of this in context and, and to make sure that I don't get uh, brought up on charges by the church police, um, clearly, again, it's, it's very clear that the, the metaphors that Jesus are, are using here are for Israel and specifically for Jerusalem, but he's also talking about mankind when it comes to this kind. Um, and I don't want to uh, rabbit trail here, but there, there's, there's a, a bigger picture that's happening. Um, right before Jesus curses the fig tree, he clears out the temple. And, and so all of it's significant. And in the same way that Jesus clears out the temple, in the same way that he curses the fig tree, he's basically putting an end to uh, he, he's telling them, that, remember I shared with you uh, in some of these Old Testament scriptures that, here it is, uh, in times when there was no fruit, um, that judgment was coming. We, we see that in Joel chapter 2, verse 22. That's what he's saying. He's going to the fig tree and he's saying there's no fruit. And so he's telling them judgment's coming. Uh, Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament prophecies for Jerusalem. I've been here Every Passover, 
You, 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 you call me Lord. You, you lay down palm branches. You lay your garments on the road on his triumphant entry. Hosanna in the highest, right? You call me Savior, but in just a short time, you'll crucify me. And, and because they didn't recognize the time of God's visitation, he's saying that there's judgment coming. He curses the fig tree. He clears out the temple as an indicator that the temple would be destroyed, that God is building up a new temple, this time a temple not made with human hands, but a temple made by God's hands. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So yes, this speaks of Jerusalem. Yes, this speaks of Israel, but it also speaks of us today. And that's where I want to park, for us today, okay? Okay, I feel like I had to clarify that. So in this particular scripture where Jesus curses the fig tree, this is so significant because I started this message with where since the origin of sin, where Adam and Eve ate of this fruit, they recognized their sin, they're immediately filled with shame and guilt, and they cover that, they try to cover that guilt with what? What do they cover up with? Fig leaves. Fig leaves. And now here is Jesus coming to recover the fumble that Adam and Eve, when they dropped the ball in the garden, Jesus is coming to make it right. And he comes to this tree because he's hungry, because he's God, and he wants fruit from his trees. And he's saying there's no fruit on this tree, only fig leaves. And he curses the tree, and the tree withers up. And the disciples are amazed. So this is not about a fig tree. This is about you and me. This is about God's people. Yes, it's about Jerusalem. Yes, it's about Israel, but it's also about us. And here's what he's saying. The number one thing that will stop you, church, from producing fruit is guilt and shame from your sin. This is what he's saying. When you are more focused on your sin and the guilt and shame that comes with it, you do not produce fruit. You only produce fig leaves. And you're always trying to hide or cover up. You know what fig leaves also represent? It also represents um, kind of like a camouflage. Like, I look like I have fruit, but I don't. At a distance, I look like I have fruit. When a fig tree is in leaf, it should have fruit. From a distance, Jesus sees it and he's hungry. When he gets closer to inspect it, there's no fruit. It also speaks of Christians who talk the talk, wear the bumper sticker, got the bracelet and the t-shirt. Oh, we got fig leaves. We just don't have any fruit. And so Jesus confronts it. He confronts it. But he doesn't just confront it, he curses it. But here's the, here's the beauty, church. Here's the beauty of the finished work of the cross. That curse in the earth that was meant for us because of our sin, God puts a curse in the earth in Genesis. He curses the ground, and he tells Adam, he says, from now on, because of your sin, I'm putting a curse in the earth, and you're going to wrestle as you try to produce in the earth. You're going to wrestle with thorns and thistles, trying to make a living, trying to produce. Everyone say thorns and thistles. It's part of the curse. Do you know what Jesus does before he goes to a cross? He takes a crown of thorns. Everyone say thorns. Jesus takes your curse. This is what he does, and he takes it upon himself. He removes it from you. The scripture also says that any man that hangs on a tree is cursed. Jesus takes the curse that was meant for you and me, this, this curse that would only produce thorns and thistles, will now produce fruit because he takes the curse and he nails it to a tree. And if it's nailed to a tree, then it's not on me. And you need to understand this, that when we celebrate that Jesus is risen, it also means that you are risen. And the thing that was stopping you from producing fruit has now been nailed to a cross. 
And we can now produce this fruit that he talks about in John 15 because now we can abide in him and him in you. And you can abide in his word and you can abide in his love. And he says, and you will produce fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. But apart from me, you can produce nothing. But we can do this now. We can do this. But not apart from him. This is what he's saying here. Man, that, that shame and that, that guilt, it's so powerful. It was so powerful. Do you know that Jesus had to go to a cross? Man, I've, I've thought about this. I, I've spent time in thinking, I've meditated on this. Like, why did he have, why the cross of all things? Like, he's God. Why couldn't, why couldn't God just forgive us? Why, why that brutal death? Why the crucifixion, right? And again, when we begin to understand it, there were so many things that were significant that Jesus was, was doing when he, when he was paying for us. The scripture tells us that the, uh, the, the cross was something that was very shameful. Uh, le- let me just read it to you like this. Uh, guys, this is the last scripture. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Who's on keys today? Deborah? Yeah. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Listen to this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. This is the next verse. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God despising the shame. Everyone say shame. When someone was crucified on a cross, they were lifted up. They were, they were elevated above the earth. And what the Romans would do is they would, they would crucify criminals. They, they would crucify these, these, these violators. And they would be stripped completely naked. And they would be lifted up and they would, uh, they would line the entrance of a city with people. That's where people were crucified, outside of the gates of the city, so that when people entered, they would see these criminals lined up. Everyone say shame. It was, it was meant to be very painful. It was a slow death, but it was very shameful, very degrading. The scripture says in Hebrews 12, despising the shame. It's important that that they included that detail with the cross because it was our shame and our guilt that caused us to hide ourselves with fig leaves. Adam and Eve sinned. They recognized their sin for the first time, but it was the shame and the guilt that made them hide and cover up. And it's, it's those fig leaves, even still for us today, that hinder us from producing fruit. But Jesus, because of the cross, because of his love, because of his faithfulness, he takes that shame, all of your guilt, all of your regret, the the things that we dare not even speak out publicly that we've done or experienced, those things, he removed them. This is what he did. He takes your shame. He takes your guilt. He takes your regret. He conquers sin and he conquers death, and he rises on the third day, victorious, seated at the right hand of the Father. This is what Hebrews 12.1 is saying. This is what he's saying. It is a finished work, church. It is a finished work of the cross. So we can confidently say, when he is risen, we are risen. My identity is found in this man, Jesus, and in the finished work of that cross. And the fruit that he expects from his trees, we can bear this fruit now because our shin, our, our shin, not your shins, but your shame and your guilt and your sin has been removed. Man, this is incredible. And so, man, you may have heard this before. You may have heard fragments of uh, this account, but I really wanted to drive home this point and make it relatable to the fruit that God expects from our lives. And this is, this is, again, this is so exciting, is that he talks about this fruit being answered prayer. Oh, I, look, there, there is so much fruit that can begin to 
blossom off of our tree. Love is one of them. Bless you. The Bible says that the, the, the world will know you're my disciples by your love. It's a fruit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a work that He does in you. You, you may say, well, I'm not very loving, or I didn't have a father that showed me love, or I didn't have parents that showed me love. I, irrespective of any of that, it doesn't matter. You get planted in this tree, you abide in this Jesus, and He will produce love through you. He'll do this in you. He'll do this in you. A generosity, kindness, patience, faith, all the gifts of the Spirit. But the one that he highlights is answered prayer. There's an answered prayer. Because it'll, it'll be an evidence to the world that they're my disciples also. That they have a real God who answers their prayer. And there's a real fruit that manifests. Man, I, church, I don't want this just to be a Sunday message. Man, I, I need you to know that this is something that you can lay hold of and you can take this today and you can apply this today and we can bear this fruit. I know I want this. How many of you want this? And I do. It's imperative that we do. Not just for your own sake, but for your family and for your children and for your neighbors and for your coworkers and for a lost and dying world. They need to see this fruit of Jesus in our life. Amen? I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to have Evan just come and help me close however he feels led and what, what the Lord's put on his heart. But let's not miss this moment because, man, we shared all of that to come to this point. We shared all of that, and I'm sure that even while I was speaking that the Holy Spirit was doing his own work and his own pruning and his own cutting and revealing things in your life. So let's just take this, this time and just allow the Lord, let's just surrender to the Lord and let him do this finished work. Father, I thank you for every person here. I, I don't believe that there is anybody here on accident today. God, I'm overwhelmed with the thought that you would come to this earth and subject yourself to all of our human frailties and, and being dependent upon a mother and a father. God, the one who created everything, Lord, you did this for us. It's, it's the greatest rescue mission in history. but you did everything perfectly and you went to that cross without sin and you went to that cross willingly to die for us. It's the greatest expression of love we've ever seen and we will ever see. And you did it for the world, but Lord, you would have done it if it was just me. And you finished that work completely. Those are your last words on the cross. It is finished. And Lord, you ransomed every person here. Everyone who was unable to produce, produce this fruit. We, we were rooted in the wrong tree. And Lord, you came and you reconciled all of that. And you cursed that tree. And you removed all of my shame and all of my guilt and all of my regret. And you took all of my sin and you nailed it to that cross. God, I thank you that you defeated our sin and you defeated death by raising on the third day, seated now at the right hand of the Father. Lord, I believe that, and I believe you, and I put all of my trust and confidence in you and in the finished work of that cross. Today, I call you my Lord, I call you my Savior, and I surrender my life to you. I surrender all to you. Thank you that you have engrafted me into you, because you're the true vine and we are the branches. And if we abide in you, in your word and in your love, we will produce fruit and fruit that remains. And I thank you for that. 
I thank you that that sinful nature has been cut away from me because of the finished work of the cross. Thank you that you are risen. And thank you that we are risen with you. In Jesus' mighty name, if you believe that, say amen. Amen. Love you guys. Who's that resonate with? I hope, I hope everybody heard it. Because it's, it's not just about hearing it. <laughs> it's about taking that and then going and doing it. It doesn't stop here. So I don't know where you're at. I know where I'm at and that I'm the only person that I get to be in charge of knowing where someone's at. And I know that I still need help. I know that I desire more. Pastor Rick said at the very beginning, right? It's a constant giving of yourself to him because if you want more of him, what does that mean? You gotta have space for him. And whatever's occupying space in you that's of you, you have to give that to him. You have to sacrifice that. You have to die to that every single day. And if you're holding on to those things, whatever they may be, they're different for each of us, but whatever you're holding on to, that's what he desires. You need to give that to him. I need to give that to him every single day. So whatever it is in our lives that is keeping us from the greater purpose, from missing the mark, right? What, the thing that's, that's making us miss the mark, that's keeping us from our intended purpose, that's what he desires from us, to give that up, to let go of those things that we hold on to. Because he, di- he desires our whole hearts. And not just saying that, right? It's one thing to say, to say, I give this to you. It's another thing to actually live like that. And sometimes I think we're, we're a little bit fearful. I know I've been fearful at times of owning it, right? The accountability that comes with saying, yeah, I want fruit. I want to see fruit in my life. Because then what happens if there's no fruit? Then I have to own it, right? That's the bumper sticker. That's why I wear a bracelet that says, I got the bracelet. And I want my wife to call me out if I'm not living like it. Until she does, and then it's hard, right? You have to live like you're saying you're going to live if you're saying you're going to live it. So no matter where you're at right now, this is a continuation of John chapter 13. Where Pastor Rick was reading. He said, I've set before you an example that you should do as I have done for you, right? We have the example in Jesus. You want to know what your life's supposed to look like? Look at his life and live like that. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if what? If you do them. You know it, now go do it. Wherever you're at, I want you to pray this prayer with me if you believe that for yourself. If you desire Jesus because you haven't seen fruit in your life, maybe you've given your life to him, you've said, Jesus, I give you my life, but then you kind of hold on to your life, right? We all do that at times with certain aspects of our life. Maybe you've never given him your life, but you say, man, I want that. Because even if you're just to look at a guy like Pastor Rick, like Vicky, look at their lives. Do you guys see fruit on them? I love that about them. That draws people to you. That's what drew people to Jesus is they saw fruit on his life. And it's not necessarily the fruit that the world says, this is what the fruit's going to look like. So don't have in your expectation, this is what it has to look like. Just give it to him. No matter where you're at in your walk, right now pray this with me. Jesus, I give you my life that I might look like you and I might sound like you and others would desire you in the same way that I do. Jesus, change me. Change me from the inside out. I want to live for you and die to myself. I love you. Amen. Man, that's good. That's good. Yes. All right. So, a couple of things. 
If you're making that choice for the first time, or you just want to connect with us, learn more about what that means, what that looks like in your life, meet us at the Connection Center back there. You can uh, click on a couple of tabs on the website that'll give you more information on that, but face-to-face is better. So head back, see Ms. Raquel at the Connection Center. That would be amazing. There are signs for your front yard back there that say, join us at Rivergate on Easter, and then they say Rivergate Ministries on the back because you're going to keep it in your front yard for the rest of your life, okay? So don't forget to turn it around, though. It'll be weird if you leave it up after Easter. you got to turn it around, okay, beyond that. A uh, couple of other things. Uh, we have a college and young adult group that meets at our house on Sunday nights. We're meeting tonight. You can come, come do that. Yeah, let's go. Uh, so if you want to get connected there, uh, come talk to us. Uh, we'll get you plugged in. Um, I think that's everything I was supposed to say, but I, I will absolutely say Jesus loves you, and he wants to go with you right now. So take him with you. Love y'all. I've been told to.